Let's just remain focused on God, what He wants to do. Allow the Holy Spirit that He will change and touch as He wants. Amen. You can turn to, in your Bibles to Hosea chapter 2. Hosea chapter 2. And I really trust that what we're going to share this morning um, is going to be a, a word of encouragement. That's what I certainly experienced is that um, God really wants to come and encourage us uh, in this time and in this season. Amen. And so what I, um, in preparation, what I just experienced is that um, last year God gave us as a congregation a, a year word and the year word was hope. And that was reiterated and underlined in the production, Hope in the House. And certainly I believe that's still what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, in this congregation. Um, he wants to restore hope through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I believe uh, what we're going to share this morning out of the Word will do the same. Well, coupled to that is um, also the year word of this year. And that is um, see what is... Um, see what he says, right? And, um, and what I, I think in a way these two year words are connected also with one another because oftentimes when we lose hope, we struggle to see what God says because we've lost hope. But also the other way around, when, uh, when we can't see what God says, we also struggle to uphold hope and to move forward in, uh, in a hopeful way. So I just trust that what, what we're going to share this morning out of the word, that God will do both, that he will restore hope, but also open up our eyes that we can see clearly what God is saying to each one of us in our lives. Amen. So, uh, so some time ago, Siobhan, my wife, shared with me um, just a word that, she, that God spoke to her in her quiet time, in her time alone with God, and that was out of Hosea, and that's what I'm going to uh, use as a scripture to begin with. Um, because it, um, after she shared it with me, the word just grew inside of me, and um, and I just felt when when Pastor Cornelius contacted me to to share um, here, if I could take one of these Sundays when when he and Pastor Jeline is not here, um, if I could preach, I just experienced that this is what I should, um, this is the word that I should share. So if you add Hosea chapter two verse fourteen says. Uh, therefore, I am now going to allure her. Um, I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her her vineyards and I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And let me begin to say that I believe God is always speaking, right? If we can tune our hearts, um, we can always hear his voice. But I also want to say that I believe God is speaking in a very special way in the wilderness, right? And, um, and, and in the desert. So if you and I go through a desert period, and, and maybe it would, it's only in certain areas of our lives, I believe in those times and in those areas, God speaks in a very special way. And if we can tune into his voice and what he says to us during those wilderness times, those times when we experience uh, or when we go through a desert, um, if we can tune our hearts to his voice and what he says, I believe it will restore hope and the desert and the wilderness experience will become a door that we walk through, a door of hope that, that, that opens up new dimensions and a new platform for what God wants to do in our lives. All right, and I, I certainly believe that's what God wants to do for you and for me um, uh, this morning. So he says in verse 14, Therefore I am now going to allure her, talking about Israel, allure her, I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. What is a desert? What does a desert experience look like? If you and I go through a desert experience, a desert, I've jotted down a, a, a number of characteristics of what a desert is. A desert is a place that is still. There's not a lot of voices. Oftentimes we struggle to hear God's voice even in the desert. But it's a place where um, 
that's stripped of all the other voices. It's a still place. It's also a place where we might feel alone, we might feel deserted, we might feel isolated from other people. And oftentimes people that go through a desert experience are amongst other people, but inside they feel lonely and they feel isolated and disconnected. A desert place is also a dry place. Um, it's a place where we think life cannot spring forth. It's a place where we think um, um, that a place that cannot hold life because it's so dry. It's a place where we feel exposed to the elements. So if you think of a desert experience, the sun is very hot, not a lot of um, trees where you, where you can find shade, and in, the, in, and in the night it's very cold. So it's a place where we feel very exposed to the elements around us. And it's also a place where we fight for survival. So if you are experiencing or going through experience where you feel this morning, maybe a certain area in your life that you isolated. There's not a lot of voices. You struggle to hear even God's voice. It's a place where you fight for survival. It's a place where you feel exposed to certain elements. You are a very good candidate that God wants to speak to you in a special way this morning. Amen. So let's open up our hearts. So this connection between uh, a desert or a wilderness and God speaking to us um, comes out very strongly in the book of Numbers. And so if you want to turn with me to Numbers chapter 1, I'm just going to re read verse 1. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting in the desert. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting in the desert. Now I'm just quickly going to say to you the Hebrew words that um, are um, in the Hebrew text for, for spoke and desert. So the Lord spoke, and the Hebrew word for spoke is dabar. You got it? Dabar. And the Hebrew word for desert is midbar. What do you hear? Dabar and midbar. It's very similar, right? And so what it actually means is that in Hebrew, the root word of desert or wilderness, midbar, the root word of that is speak, it's dabar. It's closely connected. And it just illustrates to us yet again that in the midbar, in the desert, in the wilderness, God is speaking in a special way to each one of us. It's even interwoven in the, in the Hebrew. How does God speak to us in the wilderness? That's also important. And this also comes out very strongly in, in Numbers. So did you know that the, the name of the book Numbers is not the name of the Hebrew book in the Torah? The name of the Hebrew book is actually wilderness. That's actually the name of the book. In the English translation and other translation, they gave the name Numbers. But, um, but the Hebrews took the, the word midbar in that first verse and they made that the name of the book, um, Wilderness. But what is amazing is that when it says in, in verse 2, take a census, when, when God commands Moses, take a census of the whole of, of um, is the Israelite community, in, of all the clans and the families and so on. That word for take a census, for counting, there are many words in Hebrew for counting, but um, and I want to illustrate this. But the, the word that's used here for counting literally means lifting of the head. It, lit it literally means God comes and he lifts your head and he looks in your eyes and he speaks tenderly to your heart on an individual basis. And the reason why I pause for a moment there is the book, the, the name numbers can oftentimes convey the meaning that you're just a number. You know, God is counting, you know, we're about 50, 60, and you are one of 60. You're just a number. But that's not the meaning. The meaning is that God recognizes you, and he counts you, and he lifts your head, and he looks you in the eye, and he speaks to you, especially in the wilderness. And he does it for you, and for you, and for you in a unique and an individualized way. That's how God speaks to each one of us 
especially when we go through a wilderness experience. So we get the same idea if you go, just go back to, to the book of, um, of Hosea. That's actually locked in that first verse that I read in verse 14. He says, therefore, I'm now going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and now listen carefully and speak tenderly to her heart. That's how God wants to speak to you this morning. If you say, Vietpia, I feel exposed in certain areas of my life. I feel I battle for survival. I feel alone. I feel disconnected. I feel there's no life in these areas of my life. That's the way God wants to speak to you this morning. Amen. So let's open up our hearts. So while I was preparing, I was just thinking about um, a certain time in my life when I was in a desert period and where I have experienced um, this kind of speaking uh, of God in my life. And, and there are um, a number of times that I can think of, but one of the times that I am thinking was thinking of is when I was 11 years old, um, turning 12, my parents got divorced and, and that was a very traumatic time in my life. Um, a lot of changes happened also family-wise in our immediate family during that time. And, and also at school, it was also a time when I w was exposed to an intense bully situation and got deserted by a lot of my friends. And today it sounds so simple, but as an 11-year-old boy and as a 12-year-old boy, um, I went through an extremely traumatic experience where I felt disconnected, isolated, lifeless in some aspects and I'm um, also exposed to a lot of elements that I didn't have control over. But if I reflect today about that time, it's also a very special time to me. Because that's the time where God bent down, reached out to me, and that's the time where I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the time where I got baptized. That's the time where I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And if I reflect back, I can still remember sometimes in my room as a little boy of 11, 12, how I had intimate, intimate times with God. And, and sometimes in, in times of worship, um, just in tears because I could felt the love and the presence um, of God during those times. Sometimes I just long for that intense uh, moments I had for the Lord and certainly it's still available. But but what I try to illustrate is that in my wilderness, in one of the most intense times in my life, I also experienced how God bent down, lifted my head, looked me in the eyes, and engaged with me on a very personal level. That's how God speaks in the wilderness. That how, that's how God wants to speak to you also this morning. So I believe there are three um, in the Bible, maybe more, but, but I want to highlight three deserts, kinds of deserts or wildernesses that um, where God um, says different things depending on the kind of wilderness that you go through. And I just um, want to highlight three of those deserts or wildernesses uh, to you and what God would typically say, what his loving voice would say to you um, uh, if you experience or going through a time in that specific wilderness. So I'm going to mention it to you and then we're going to look together at each one of them. The first wilderness is a wilderness that you experience because of your own mistakes or your own um, bad decisions or choices that you've made. Sometimes we make decisions and, um, and we end up in a wilderness where we feel exposed, um, lifeless, um, fighting for survival, but it's due to our own mistakes. So that's the first kind of wilderness that we could go through. And let me just say, maybe you, as we go through this, you, you say, no, it's not me. No, it's not me. I'm all right. It's not applicable to me. But maybe you're sitting here this morning and you need to hear this word because God wants to use you to encourage somebody during this week who are going through uh, similar experiences. Right, so that's the first wilderness. Um, you, you end up in that place due to your own mistakes. The second wilderness is uh, a place where you also feel you're fighting for survival, you, you're exposed and, and all the others because of the mistakes other people made 
right? And the impact it has on you puts you in a wilderness, a place where you feel exposed and fighting for survival. So that's the second kind of wilderness that we can go through from time to time, a place due to the mistakes of other people. And then uh, the last wilderness is a wilderness due to our successes, right? And I will explain a bit more, but sometimes our own successes and our accurate walk with God puts us in a place where we could find ourselves in a kind of a desert experience. All right, are you ready? So we're going to look at each one of those. So the first wilderness is uh, a wilderness where, where you find yourself due to your own mistakes and the bad choices that you've made. So let's just turn in our Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. Um, Exodus chapter 3. And uh, may I ask if somebody would be willing just to get me a glass of water, please? That would be great. So Exodus chapter 3, um, and I'm reading from verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that um, though the bush was on fire and did not burn up, so Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, bush Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. And we know the rest of the story, how God then just um, restored him to the calling that um, was on his life and how God used him further on um, in an intense, intense way, one of the major, major leaders uh, in the Old Testament. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. But what we need to know is that... Um, Before that, the reason why Moses was in the desert in Midian is he made a huge mistake. He killed somebody. Um, if you remember the story, you know, he knew that God called him to deliver the Israelites, took matters in his, in, into his own hands. He saw how um, Egyptian harassed um, an Israelite and he, um, he, he stepped into the situation and he killed the Egyptian. And then he had to flee. So in actual fact, here in this wilderness, Moses was under self-condemnation. He was actually hiding. He was running away from the calling and from the place where God called him. And God bent down and he spoke to him there. And he said, Moses, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to wash away the past and I'm going to restore you to the calling and the dream I have for your life. If we just go back to Isaiah, in verse 15, it says, There I will give her back her vineyards and I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. The valley of Achor a door of hope. The word Achor, the valley of Achor, the word Achor, literally means trouble. I'm, I'm going to make the valley, of, the valley of trouble a door of hope. Now, what's significant is if you, if you think what happened in the valley of Achor, if you, if you just make a note, you can go and read it maybe this week if you want to, Joshua 7. In Joshua 7, it explains to us what happened in the valley of Achor. And this is significant, so that's why I quickly want to, to explain to you what happened there. Um, what, what happened is under the leadership of Joshua, they entered the promised land and they conquered Jericho. It was a miracle, major victory. And then after, and God said, um, you, um, you can't take anything uh, from, from the city of Jericho for yourself. It belongs to me. And by the way, it's connected in a certain way to the, to the notion of first fruits because it was the first city that they took in and God said, everything belongs to me. I don't want to go into that now. But, um, but God said, you can't touch anything. This belongs to me. And, and Achan, um, one of the Israelites, took some of the stuff and he, he, he hid it in his tent. 
And so what happened, this, the, the consequences of what, that was that when they had to attack Ai, the city of Ai, which was a much smaller city, um, they couldn't defeat the city. Um, and then uh, Joshua and the leaders, you know, just went before the Lord and said, well, what is happening here? Lord, you promised that we will take the promised land. God says, well, there's sin in your, in your camp. And then they cast the lot and Achan and his family um, you know, got exposed and they, they said, yes, Achan said, yes, I took um, some of the goods from, from Jericho. And then they actually stoned Achan and his whole family and, and his animals, and I think they burned it also. It is a place of shame. And God says, I'm going to take the place of shame, your biggest embarrassing embarrassment, the place where, that, that you are so ashamed of that you want to hide like Moses did. I'm going to take that place. I'm, I'm going to make it a valley of hope. Isn't God amazing? Isn't God awesome? God is in the restoration business. And you might sit here today and you must say, Vipia, in certain areas of my life, maybe in finances, I have made so much mistakes. I've been so disobedient and reckless and I find myself in a desperate situation. God says, my love and my grace is bigger than your mistakes. I can restore you. God can restore you. Maybe in the area of relationships. Maybe you've messed up big time in your marriage. Maybe you've messed up big time with your family. Maybe you messed up big time with the opportunities God gave you to equip yourself for the dream and the plan God has got for you. And you just lost hope and, and you're in a place where you feel that there's absolutely no hope for life. I've given up. I'm actually hiding because I'm so ashamed because of the mistakes and the choices I made. I want you to hear that God says to you this morning, I am able to restore you. God is bigger than your mistakes and God is in the restoration business. Amen? Do you take that? I, um, there's, there's, a beautiful, there's a beautiful quotation from Corrie ten Boom the lady that uh, the dutch lady that also went to the concentration camps in the second world war because she hit jews and helped the jews and and she suffered much because of that also went into the nazi concentration camps and she she once said well probably not once many times but but one of her quotes is that no hole is too deep where god's love is not deeper still No matter the mistakes that you've made, no matter how deep the hole is where you find yourself, God's love is much greater and he can restore you. We also see that in the, um, at the end of John and um, where, where God restores uh, the apostle Peter to his calling and, and his destiny. And we know the story how Peter deserted Jesus um, in his most desperate hour, and um, he denied him three times. Jesus told him it, it will happen like that. And, um, um, but Peter still denied him, and he was ashamed, um, and probably, um, you know, they went to catch fish, fish and it, the Bible doesn't say it, but probably Peter was at a place where he said, well, you know, I blew it. Um, I might as well just go back to my first occupation of a fisherman. And Jesus appeared to them. And in verse 15 we read, um, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you truly know me? Do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Now, feed my lambs means that I'm restoring you to your calling all right, for a first time, you denied, my, denied me three times. Cancel that denial, number one, restoring you, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. I'm restoring you a second time. I'm restoring you. 
The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And, um, and of course, we know the role that Peter played in the entire New Testament. God is in the restoring business. And, and I just pray, let me end off by this section of the sermon by saying that um, no matter the mistakes that you made in the past, no matter how disappointment, disappointed you might feel today about the, the choices, some of the bad choices you made, some of the mistakes you made, God says, I forgive you. And today, if you listen to my voice, I can restore you to the plan and the destiny, the dream that I've got for your life. You need to take it by faith. Amen. I believe this is really for some of you. The second desert that we can find ourselves in is a desert um, where we find ourselves in because of the mistakes other people made. The impact of other people's choices, bad choices and mistakes impacting us. And uh, we find ourselves in a desperate place where we're fighting for survival. So if you can just turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 16 and chapters 21. But we'll first look at, at chapter 16. And this is um, the story of Abraham and Sarai and Hagar. And so if you remember, what happened is they, they couldn't have children. Uh, that's before um, Ishmael and, and Isaac was born. Of course, it goes without saying. Why, why do I say that? They couldn't have children. And, um, and at a certain stage, Sarai was, was, was very desperate. And she said to Abraham, well, listen, here is my slave woman, um, Hagar. Take her and have a child with her. And then at least we will have some uh, a line of uh, descendants. And um, Abraham listened uh, to his wife. He did it. And then, um, and then uh, Hagar fell pregnant. And that created some animosity between herself and Sarai. And up to the point where, where she um, fled into the desert. And then in verse 6, we says, it says, um, Your servant is in your hands, Abraham said uh, to Sarai. Uh, Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai ill-treated Hagar, so she fled from her. So what we see here is because of the choices that Abraham and Sarai made, it impacts now Hagar, and she finds herself literally in a desert place. So the angel of the Lord, verse 7, found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. Um, from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. And then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. And then um, in verse 13, uh, it says, she gave the name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. So um, before I go on to chapter 21, so when God speaks to you in a desert place or a desperate place where you find yourself because of the impact of the bad choices other people made, God speaks in a way where he first of all confirms that he sees you. He understands what you're going through. He understands that it's unjust what you are experiencing. He sees and he hears. And he goes beyond that. He says that I've got a wonderful future for you. You will have, you will have a blessed future. And your descendants will be too numerous to count, he said to Hagar. So God is serious about the fact that you and I sometimes get treated unjust. And why we need to understand this, that God speaks to us in a very special way if we find ourselves in that place, is because the first feeling, I don't know about you, but certainly in my life, the first feeling is, this is so unjust. Can nobody see that this is unjust, that I'm ill-treated, this is unfair? Does God 
where is God? Doesn't he know about the situation? And you sort of feel exposed and that you are delivered into the hands of this unjust situation and that they've got control over the, your future. Isn't that how we feel? Okay, I confess, that's how I feel sometimes. And you get angry and frustrated because you feel powerless because your future is in the hands of other people that are making bad choices. And what God comes and he says to you in that situation, no, 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 that's not true. First of all, I see what is going on. I know what's going on. And secondly, your future is not in the hands of an unjust situ situation and choices other people are making. Your future is in my hands and I will work out everything for the good of those who love me. Amen? So in verse 21, we see the same thing. This is now even more desperate because Isaac, little Isaac, is now birthed and now the turbo kicks in in the dynamics in that household. And, um, and then Sarah says, I have had it. They have to go. And, um, and then Hagar and her son ends up in the desert with a little bit of bread and water. And then, um, and then at a certain stage, in verse 15, chapter 21, verse 15, when the water and the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down nearby about a bow shot away, uh, for she thought, I cannot watch the bo boy die. Uh, talking about fighting for survival. Ne? And as she sat there nearby, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying. God heard the boy crying. God heard the boy crying. Not only God sees El Roy, God sees, God heard, God sees you and God hears you. God hears your crying because of the unjust situation. And the angel of the God called Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the, the boy crying. As he lies there, lift the boy up and take him by the hand. And then God opened up her eyes and God provided a well of water and God confirmed that God will bless the boy and they will have a blessed future. Your hands, your life is not in the hands of people, other people's choices. Your life is in the hands of God. There's one more scripture that I just want to read in Isaiah that underlines this. It's a well-known scripture, Isaiah 40, verse 27. It says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? And I can put my name there, I can promise you. Why do you say, O Vipia, and complain, O Vipia? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. And they will walk and not faint. So I've just written down um, when I, in my preparation a couple of situations that you might or that people might experience where negative choices of other people are impacting your life. And, um, and maybe this is helpful to you or to other people that you will encourage in this week. Oftentimes we experience a situation like this when, when there's a a separation, uh, a divorce happening. Um, or when somebody was dishonest in, um, in business or um, unjust in a work situation. Or sometimes um, crime also impacts our lives in a certain way. The negative choices um, of other people impact our lives. Sometimes it's in the context of a family where certain family members make certain choices and it impacts your life. Or sometimes it is political leaders. 
that are just making unwise decision and it's impacting our lives, impacting the economy. And the natural reaction is that we can get angry and we can get frustrated. I want you to hear this morning that God says that he knows, he hears, he sees, and he understands. But we've also got the responsibility, and our responsibility is to forgive, number one. We can't block out God's working by holding on to bitterness and unforgiveness. Our responsibility is to forgive and to really release and to pray. I remember, if I think back of situation, wilderness situation, situations like this where other people's unwise decisions impact me. One of the best things that I could do to keep my focus in those times would be, of course, to forgive. And sometimes I have to forgive that person 40 times, uh, 70 times 7 for the same person for the same thing on the same day um, to convince myself. But also then to pray for that person. And I remember of a situation where I had to pray for a person where, where I really experienced that person was out to get me. Out to get me. And, and I made a point of it, of interceding for that person very frequently. It helped me to keep the focus. And you know what? God just turned that situation around. And, and um, in a couple of months, or I can't remember if it was a, a year or two or three even, God turned it around up to the point where that person was in a desperate situation and where Siobhan and I had to minister to that person and that family. You will never know why God has placed you in that situation and how he's going to turn it around. Amen. May God just, just um, intervene in that situation if you are there and just surprise you by his goodness and how he's going to turn it around. Amen. Your hand... Your life is in the hands of God, all right? And in that situation, God speaks with a voice of confirmation and a voice of, um, of care. The last uh, wilderness where we find ourselves in um, is a wilderness where uh, we end up in a situation, a desperate situa situation, because of the success and our accurate walk with God. Right, so let's quickly turn in our Bibles to... Um, 1 Kings 19, 1 Kings 19, and that's the story of Elijah, and uh, let me just get there. So Elijah in, in chapter 19, um, well let me just first explain, in chapter 18, uh, Elijah experiences one of the biggest breakthroughs of his ministry. Um, for three and a half years, it was not raining in Israel, intense drought, and uh, the king and his servants were looking for Elijah because he, was, he, he actually prophesied that it will, it will not rain, and they were looking for him everywhere to kill him. And, um, and then he exposed himself under God's guidance after three and a half years. And he gathered all the Baal prophets, 450 of them, gathered them on the Mount Carmel. And you know the story where the, they had to build an altar and put a bull on there. And they prayed and he mocked them, pray a bit louder, maybe Baal is sleeping and so on and so forth. And he even in that drought took water and threw it over his own sacrifice. And at the time of the evening sacrifice, he called down fire and the fire consumed. Um, he sacrificed the stones and the water and everything. And he said, now, he said, well, you must decide who you want to serve, Baal or God. And then the fire came down and he said, now grab the, the Baal prophets and kill them. And they, they slaughtered. 450 of them, it was a huge breakthrough um, for, for God um, and in Israel. And then it, um, it started to rain after three and a half years. One of the, the biggest, biggest breakthroughs in Elijah's ministry. Yet in chapter 19, um, we read that after that, Jezebel said, well, now I'm going to go and get you, um, uh, Elijah. And, um, and Elijah then just fled into the wilderness and he told his servant, 
you know, you stay here. And he even went another day's journey further into the wilderness. And then in uh, verse 4, let's read verse 4. While he himself went, to, went a day's journey into the desert, he came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And he laid down under the tree and fell asleep. So sometimes in our lives, we, because of the accuracy and the stature in our lives, um, it invokes resistance uh, from, from the enemy and from people around us. Have you experienced that? There's, there's no sin in your life. You're walking an accurate life. You're giving it your all. You're going from glory to glory. And the stature of righteousness standing up in your life is of such that it's intimidating to people, especially people not serving God. And because of the onslaught and the resistance that gets invoked through this process, you just get tired. You end up in a place where you say, I just can't anymore. Lord, I know that you've got this race for me. Um, you bless me. There's impact through my life. I walk in accuracy with you and with your spirit. But the resistance it invokes from the enemy is just so intense that I just feel I just can't carry on anymore. I'm burnt out. I can't. And oftentimes we end up in a situation like that when uh, after we, we um, really had a huge breakthrough and, uh, and, and gave a huge blow to the, to the work of the enemy. And that's where Elijah was. And so in, um, um, in verse 5 it says, okay, he went down and, and slept and, and all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. So this guy was really down and out. He ate and went down to sleep again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by the food. He traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb. By the way, Horeb is the same place where God spoke to Moses um, in the burning bush. Um, until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into the cave and spent the night. And we know the rest of the story, how God spoke to him. He got new strategy and that brought breakthrough and uh, Jezebel and Ahab got removed and there was just a huge breakthrough are you maybe sitting in a place in your life where where you are walking accurate with god you have walked accurately with god and but you're just tired you just feel that you've got no energy to carry on god wants to bend down he wants to lift your head he wants to look you into the eyes he wants to speak to you and that voice will be a voice of grace that will enable you to complete the race God has set out before you. God knows you can't do it out of your own strength. It's not possible. And God knows that you and I are only human and sometimes we feel that we can't anymore. We can't handle the resistance. I certainly experienced something like that during this week but you know what God is faithful and when we find ourselves in a desert or a wilderness like that all that we need to do we need to allow the Holy Spirit to speak tenderly to our hearts so that God can speak grace divine enablement over us and say through me you can do everything we sang it this morning amen and God's grace is enough. Paul said it when he prayed three times, take away this thing from me. God said, my grace, help me, is sufficient for you. And that's what God wants to tell you. God's grace will be there and he will enable you. Get quiet. Get into the presence of God. God will strengthen you.
supernaturally, and you will be able to run the race. And what I trust is that each one of us will one day, after we've completed our race, we will stand before the King of Kings and he will look lovingly at you and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Over few you have been faithful. Over many I will give you authority. Amen. Let's take that by faith. Amen. So I'm ending off by saying that we read in Matthew chapter 5, chapter 4, that uh, Jesus was also led into the wilderness. Do you remember that? By the Holy Spirit. And I believe it's not coincidence that he was led into the wilderness because that's the place where you and I often have to make and face tough decisions and tough challenges. And the Bible says he was tempted. That's why he was led into the wilderness. He was tempted. But he won. Right? He won the victory. And um, he overcame all the temptations, all the tough decisions, all the challenges. And you know what? When he died on that cross without sin, he bore our, our sin and our challenges. He took upon him so that we can walk away with the victory. Amen. And I'm not going to read it now, but Hebrews chapter 4 says that we can go boldly to the throne of God. Even in our times when we go through a wilderness experience, we can go boldly before the throne of God. Why? Why? Because we've got a high priest that understands. He was a human. He was fully God, but yet he was fully human. And he also went through a wilderness. And he faced the challenges. So that you and I don't have to experience the sting of the wilderness. But that the wilderness can become a door of hope. If we hear the voice of the door of the sheep, Jesus Christ, that wilderness experience will become a door of hope also for you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your marvelous goodness, your grace and your love for each person sitting here in this venue today. Father, I pray for every person that is currently going through a wilderness experience, feeling isolated, disconnected, lifeless and exposed because of bad decisions they have made. Maybe shame, maybe self-condemnation. I pray, Father, that you will come this morning through your Holy Spirit and wipe away every self-condemnation in Jesus' name. You take it away this morning by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you say to them, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But because, Jesus, you paid the price, there is full restoration to the plan and the dream that you've got for each one of those individuals. Thank you that we can declare this morning through the blood of Christ, today is a new day. Today is a new beginning. It's a fresh start. And God says to you that I'm restoring you to walk into that plan and that dream and that destiny that I've got for your life. And I will enable you to do that. My grace is sufficient for you. Father, I pray for every person that feels that they are bearing or experiencing the impact of the bad decisions and the choices of other people, where they might feel exposed, where they might feel it's unfair, where they might feel frustrated, where they have lost hope because of the bad decisions of other people. I pray in this moment, Father, that they will hear your voice. And that the truth will cut through the lie that their lives is not in the hands of other people. It's not in the hands of circumstances. But their lives and their futures are in your hand and your hand alone. Thank you, Father, that you confirm this morning that you see and that you hear. You see what's going on and you've heard every cry. And you will provide, Lord, even in desperate situations, you will provide you are faithful, you will provide. 
and that you are confirming this morning that even for them and their children, there is a hope and a future, and that all fear will bow their knee before the love that you are pouring out into their hearts in this moment. Father, lastly, I pray for every person that are just tired, that just feel that they want, want to give up. They have served you faithfully, but because of faithfulness, Lord, because of the breakthroughs, because of accuracy, because of a walk with you, they have ended up in a place where they feel burnt out, where they feel that they can't finish this race. It's too much. The demand is too high. I pray in this moment, Holy Spirit, that you will come right now and that you will speak tenderly to their hearts and that your voice will nourish, that your voice will refresh, that your voice will give new energy, that your voice will give new strategy and that your voice will enable them in a supernatural way to complete and to be faithful, to complete the race that you've marked out and set out before them. They will the, complete the race faithfully and accurately according to your plan and by your grace. We just thank you for that. We honor you for that, that we can ask and pray all of this in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in that name alone. Amen.